Hello, and welcome back to Meet Me in the Middle. This is your host, Neely. Thank you again so much for being here. Please don't forget to visit my website, Find Unity in the Middle, and go to the episode resources page to dig deeper into the facts of each episode. Before we get started on this next episode, I wanted to take a moment and reflect on what we've gone through already. I really want to point out some of the things we are learning together and my purpose to highlight some of the key facts that are front and center of some of the key debates we have today. Our founding story contains many perspectives and when told together, it can leave us feeling shocked, angry, sad, or enlightened. We cannot undo our past, but we can see through time how many attempts have been made to do better going forward. This is in no way meant to be dismissive of the brutality of our past. However, It's meant to educate us in regards to our truth, our common truth, as the truth shall set you free. We must join hands under one nation, under one flag, with one fight, as we are all equal citizens now under the law. We have a great foundation that was carefully designed to empower and protect us all as citizens. But like many legal structures and laws, they can be abused, broken, without justice, and stretched for gain of power and wealth. The elites of our society, also known as the 1%, are driving our division, and we keep backing it over and over. The media is driven by ratings and sensationalized headlines, which increase viewership, the lifeblood of the media industry. These industries are also run by the elite. Powerful companies and industries influence political agendas through lobbying and also run by the elite. We must join in the battle to claim our power, the power of the people. The power we hold was designed to withstand any one term or any one bad leader. Our country is not about the person who runs for office. It's about the power we transfer to that seat and in turn, the person we elect to sit in it. We've gone through the founding documents which lay out our structure and gone at least two levels down into how our government works. In our founding, can you find politics and religion being designed as the driving force of policy and government? Our claims of protection A deity, a god, came at times of war to claim supremacy against our enemies. The first time was during the Civil War to claim slavery as immoral and unholy. The second was during the Cold War to claim Russian oppression was guided by evil forces and that the United States is against that evil and we as a righteous nation of freedom fighters will prevail. So I feel like the more we understand and dispel some of the founding myths, the more power we as a people claim together, as we are the power that is protected under the Constitution. The protection to practice any belief and the protection to gather and protest as a body are all part of that right. However, When belief and association intermingle with our governance, that is when the threat against our union is visible to all. 
The leaders of these two dividing forces have one thing in common. They are elite. They're the ones who put out the messages and, and campaigns to drive fear and anger and division. The largest threat to the elite is our numbers and the power afforded each of us under the Constitution. We all know about the 1% versus the 99%. This is a message that has carried through our 247 years of existence. In the beginning, it was easier for their elite to push forward and the aristocrats feared one day all people will join to take the power laid at their feet. That time is now together. We can drive these divisions out if we choose to do so. Unity is the only way to save our union. We are the leader we seek. Balance is key to holding our country together. Compromise is the daily job of our leaders. Those compromises are hard decisions and we must ensure the leaders that we place at that table who negotiate these compromises on our behalf are truly working in our best interest, not because they are in line with a campaign agenda of a party, because they are about making America a more perfect union. No matter what values you hold or what side that you find yourself on, so as we go into this next series of episodes, let's keep in mind the power that we, the people, hold. We must admit that we have slowly diluted our power by aligning ourselves and dividing ourselves in practice as it was never designed with that intention. We can all agree that the 1% holds too much influence and we must pay attention to how and who has pushed their way onto our ballots. The big saying is follow the money. That couldn't be truer today than it has always been true. Both sides have their elites. The elites divide us with politics and religion. This series is called the Election and Voting Series, told over four parts. This part, we will go into elections and the Electoral College, how political parties drive our elections in each state. The next is congressional districts, the mapping, the redistricting, the re gerrymandering, and the transparency to help us understand how we are divided. Campaigns and conferences will be the next one. This will include lobbying and campaign finance, laws and practices across the states. The last is voting, which we will include voter registration, voter laws in the various states. This section or series is all about the most important part of our participation in self-governance. Understanding this at a city, county, state, and country level will empower us all to make better choices in the future. So let's dive into it. I do want to start with a quote from Abraham Lincoln in eight, from 1854. Most governments have been based practically on the denial of equal rights of men. Ours began by affirming those rights. They said some men are too ignorant and vicious to share in government. Possibly so, said we. And by your system, you would always keep them ignorant and vicious. We proposed to give all a chance and we expected the weak 
to grow stronger, the ignorant wiser, and all the better and happier together. We made the experiment, and the fruit is before us. That was Abraham Lincoln's view. Self-governance was a dangerous and extreme idea at the time for monarchies and dictators and rulers. An idea that the people be given such power was scary. There was much debate at the convention of the colonies to develop the law of the land and the structure that would be needed to balance power. We are a representative democracy, a constitutional republic. The constitution was designed to hold. The framework and design of how our participation would be practiced The protections required to be set to ensure self-governance would hold our union together forever. This was a key topic when drafting our Constitution. Our guiding principles are rooted in liberty and justice and freedom for all. This wasn't for all until 1965. That's just a fact. So only 58 years since having passed the last bill that ensured every citizen had the right to vote, which means every citizen given the power to choose our path forward. Only 58 years. And why do I say that? because not all people were seen as equal participating citizens of the United States until 1965. Is it working? Have we really made it easy and free for all to participate? Let's find out together. The Electoral College was put in place for one election every four years. The only purpose of the Electoral College is to choose who would lead the executive branch as president and vice president. We, the people, vote who we would like to lead on the second Tuesday in November after the first Monday of November every four years. The Electoral College vote in December on the second, on the Monday preceding the second Wednesday of December. Who are the electors and why do they exist? It was heavily debated as how the president would be elected. They, the Electoral College was put in place to remove the direct passions of men who were seen as unqualified to directly choose our supreme leader. So the electors were meant to balance the voices of men and ensure those choices were sound. We have direct democratic involvement of choosing all other members of our state and federal representatives and leaders, the president is different. We see the power that the executive branch has, so this leader must be capable of such a large task. Many argue the Electoral College is undemocratic. Is it? Let's look at the rules they must follow in each state. This is a state-driven process. All voting and election laws are decided at the state level. Let's first look at what the Constitution says about the Electoral College. I will read Article 2, Section 1 in its entirety. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America 
he shall hold his office during the term of four years, and together with the vice president chosen for the same term, be elected as follows. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislator thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. But no senator or representative or person holding an office of, of trust or profit under the United States shall be appointed an elector. I do want to stop there for a second and talk about our electors. There are 538 electors in America. That is the maximum number that will ever be. This is directly tied to the census and the districts. Every state gets two senators, so that's a hundred electoral votes. That leaves 438. Three electors were assigned to the District of Columbia, so that leaves 435 to be allocated based on the census. One representative per state is a given, so that's 50, leaving 385 to be allocated according to the apportionment rules based on population. So each state is given a number of electors to vote for president. 538 electors vote in the American presidential elections. Let's look at the top six states. So California by population. California has 54 electoral votes. Texas has 40. Florida has 30. New York has 28. Pennsylvania and Illinois have 19. This is a total of 190 of the 538 coming from just six states. 270 are required to win the presidential election. Let's go back to the finishing Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for two persons, of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves, meaning the vice president and the president cannot come from the same state. And they shall make a list of all persons voted for and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States, directed to the President of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be President. If such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed, and if there be more than one who have such majority, and have an equal number of votes, then the House of Representatives shall immediately choose by ballot one of them for president, and if no person have a majority, then from the five highest on the list, and said House call shall in like manner choose the president. But in choosing the president, the vote shall be taken by states. The representation from each state having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from two thirds of the states and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice. In every case, after the choice of the president, the person having the greatest number of votes of the electors shall then be vice president. But if there should remain two or more who have equal votes, the Senate shall choose from them by ballot the vice president. 
The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. No person except a natural born citizen or citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible to the office of president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and have 14 years a resident in the United States. In the case of the removal of the president from office or of his death, resignation, reg resignation or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president and the Congress may by law provide the case of removal, death, resignation, or inability both of the president and vice president, declaring what officer shall then act as president and such officer shall act accordingly until the disability be removed or a president shall be elected. The president shall, as stated times, receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased or diminished during the period for which he shall, ha shall have been elected and shall not receive within the period any other emollient from the United States or any of them. Before he enter the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. That is what was laid out about the election of President and the Electoral College. There was a 12th Amendment passed to allow the electors to cast one vote for president and one vote for vice president. This was going to reduce the issues around a tie. The number of top candidates also was changed from the top five to the top three in the event that the Congress had to choose uh, the president or the vice president. It was after the election of 1796 and 1800, having had to be elected by the House as there was a tie, it, this new law of the 12th Amendment went into effect for the 1804 election. The debate on how elections would be chosen, ch electors would be chosen, and the rules that they must follow, as well as the qualifications, were discussed in great detail. And as the number of electors were guided by the Constitution only through the every 10 years in a census, however, the practices of the appointment and rules and laws of those electors are decided by the states. There have been various modes um, of this selection were adopted for the appointment of electors in each state and from the beginning it was different to how it's done now. But the different modes of electing the electors or appointing the electors, some of them were done by the state legislators they chose the electors of both, in both houses. Some were by vote of the people at the state level. Some were by vote of the people at the district level. There was a combination of the people and the legislators. Each state has different rules, and it's important to check your state sites to understand this. Also, each state sets the rules that those electors must follow when voting. Some say that they must follow the popular vote. Some say they must follow the popular vote by party. And in many cases, this is through a state or party pledge. The majority of the states today allow each major political party to put forward their slate of electors. Meaning, 
after the primary, they know who the top two candidates are. And in almost all cases, they've been opposing parties. Um, as the parties then put forward their number one candidate from the primaries. When those two are put onto the general election ballot to go to vote in November, what happens is both parties have their slate of electors. So let me choose California being the most populous state. They have 54 electors that vote for the president and vice president. So in always in the case of it's the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, both of the parties put forward to the state secretary their 54 elector names. So you have to check your states to see what qualified parties are there. There is a proce process on how these candidates are chosen by the states to move on to the general election. And it's the primary elections that drive the, one, the, the names that go on to the general election when we vote for the president. However, the rules on who and how to choose who moves to the general election ballot is handled very differently in each state. Whoever wins the general election is whose slate of electors are going to be put forward to vote for the president. It's very clear that we understand we are not voting on the president or vice president. We are voting for their slate of electors that they've put forward. In some states, the slate of electors are listed under the candidates. In some states, it's not. Most states, it's just the president and vice president when we're voting. So you really have to check your states and your ballots to see how that works. And we are going to go into voting and voter registration and parties and so on in a future episode. But it is important to understand this. There's only one real difference of how the elector votes are counted. And that's in Nebraska and Maine, where there is a slate of electors by district assigned by district after two electors that are sworn to follow the popular vote of the state and then the other electors in each district will cast a vote based on the popular vote of the district. This is the closest to what the founders intended for the electoral college. All other states have a winner take all method. So in California, for example, all 54 votes will go to one candidate. This is then the responsibility through an oath that the electors take that swears to follow the process that the party dictates for the electors who are voting. So the parties are dictating what the electors and who the electors can, what they can vote for. The oath and laws and vary across the states. So it's really important to look at your state. On my website, I do have a link to all of the election offices and you just choose your state. So check out my website under the elect, uh, episode resources in elections and the electoral college and you'll be able to find it there. All other elections are counted by the popular vote. It's only the vote for president that isn't managed in that same way. The political parties drive our elections and appoint the appointment of president and vice president. And since the president and vice president are 
come as really one package, even though they're voted for separately, it's really changed over time. The intention, however, of the founders is that the districts would each appoint the elector, an elector for the district. In the Federalist Argument 68 by Alexander Hamilton, and I quote, a small number of persons selected by the fellow citizens for the general mass will be most likely to possess the information and discernment requisite to such complicated tasks. The framers have not made the appointment of the president to depend on any pre-existing bodies of men to be pledged to vote one way or another who might be tempered or tampered, tampered with beforehand to prostitute their votes to be told how to vote. They knew that this could happen. They warned us of these dangers. But they have referenced it the first instance immediate act of people. And regardless of these worries and concerns, here we are, political parties driving our elections. Electors were supposed to be elected to that position by the district as intended. However, this task was delegated to the states and most of the states have adopted the party slate of electors process, which is discussed in the U.S. Supreme Court opinion in 2020 when the court cited John Jay's view that electors' choices would reflect uh, discretion and discernment, reflecting on the original intention of the framers. A U.S. Senate report in 1826 critiqued the evolution of the system that was developed. In 1833, Supreme, Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story detailed how badly, from the framers' intention, the Electoral College had been subverted. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton were so upset by the trend of general tickets that Hamilton act, uh, advocated for a constitutional amendment to prevent anything other than the district plan. Hamilton, however, died during a duel and never brought it forward. Thomas Jefferson agreed with Hamilton and Madison, but he explained to Madison's correspondent why he was doubtful of the amendment being ratified. And I quote, The states are now so numerous that I despair of ever seeing another amendment of the Constitution. So, I believe this is our call to action to take up this fight on behalf of our framers' intentions. First, we must understand state by state how this is designed and practiced. Demand this change at the local level. To get this changed at the state level, as a constitutional amendment may prove to be harder in this subject. The state's level would be a fight worth taking up to demand the electoral model be adopted to a district model as intended. This is all related to the primary and general election for the purposes of choosing our leader of the executive branch, the highest honor and appointment in this country, the President of the United States. The rules of who can vote for what by state will be discussed in the voting episode. However, the elections and voting as you can already see, have been subverted to be party-driven 
And that was never the intention. Political parties have to be qualified and approved at a state level. The primary process is solely for the party to choose their one candidate nationwide. And the political parties even allow Puerto Rico citizens to vote in their primaries, even though they have no constitutional rights to vote in our general elections or any election federally. The electors are nominated by parties. The slate of electors nominated by the party choose the president. That is the process. This process pushes us further away from the founders and framers' intention on our participation in choosing the president or vice president. All other elected officials and are done by popular vote by the people. Once the general election is done, each state must send seven certificates of ascertainment, each listing their pledged electors and the total each candidate received in the general election. This is sent to the National Archivist and must carry the state seal and the signature of the governor or mayor in the District of Columbia. Electors in their state gather on the Monday after the second Wednesday in December to cast their votes on separate ballots for president and for vice president. The electors gather and the state's secretary of state or equivalent reads the certificate of ascertainment. The attendance is taken, vacancies are noted in writing, then the selection of president or chairman, and sometimes vice chairman, to preside over the meeting commences. Sometimes they choose a secretary, and in some states, political officials give short speeches before the electoral votes. They choose one or two tellers who will tally the votes. Each elector is given a ballot for president, and then each elector is given a ballot for vice president. By law, under the Electoral Vote Act, each elector must complete six certificates of vote. Each certificate must be signed by all electors. It must include the name of who, became, who received uh, electoral vote for president and for vice president. One is sent by registered mail to the president of the Senate, who's the incumbent vice president, two to the archivist, two to the secretary of state, and one to the chief judge uh, district court where the electors met. The Office of Federal Register reviews to make sure that they match. The certificates are arranged in alphabetical order in two mahogany boxes, Alabama through Missouri and Montana through Wyoming. January 6, in a joint session of Congress, the incumbent vice president reads the electoral votes for president and vice president, and the winners will be sworn in on January 20th, where the transfer of power is completed through the swearing-in ceremonies. The Electoral Count Act of 1887 laid out the rules of January 6. This was reformed in 2022 after the, um, the confirm and debate of what power the VP has during the January 6 ceremony, ceremony as there was much confusion after the 2020 election. This concludes the episode, and I hope you gained some insight into how our elections are run. Please see my website and on your state site to understand how elections and the Electoral College is run in your state. The more we know, the more we grow. Until next time, Meet Me in the Middle is all about finding those key things that bind us 
and not focused on what divides us. There's many things that we can do together. And until next time, meet me in the middle. Please visit the website, like, share, wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you.